Number three, Nancy Stewart Ranko Williams. Nancy Stewart Ranko Williams was born and raised in Pohad Point, Ohio. When she was 16, she gave birth to a daughter named Jennifer. Jennifer was raised by Williams' parents because Williams lived an unstable lifestyle. She hitchhiked, she drank heavily, she was addicted to drugs, and she worked as a sex worker. In early 1988, Williams was living in Sandy Springs, Georgia. She made frequent trips to visit her family in Ohio. When she would visit, she would stay at Motel in Wheeling, which is just across the state line in West Virginia. Her family knew that she was meeting with Johns when she stayed in Wheeling. During this time, Williams wasn't living alone, nor was she alone when she traveled back to visit her family. She was always with a man who went by several different names. He told people his name was Robert or Bob Matthew, Tom Katz, Bob or Tom Wilson, and Tom or Robert Tate. Williams told several family members that she was afraid of her boyfriend. She also said she wanted to leave him, but she couldn't. Then in February 1988, Williams, who was 26 years old, stopped calling her family. Around the time they lost contact with her, Williams' boyfriend called her family. He said that Williams had left him and she was moving back to Ohio. But Williams' family never saw or heard from her again. They also never heard back from the mysterious boyfriend who went by multiple names. 30 years later, Williams' family still doesn't know what happened to her. They believe that she is most likely dead and her boyfriend probably had something to do with it. In 2016, a television news program was doing a story about Williams' disappearance and they uncovered a photograph of Williams' mysterious boyfriend. It is one of two photographs of the man that the police have. The other photograph has never been made public. The police have no idea who the man is. Because he used different aliases, the police believe that he had something to hide with regards to his true identity. The police are hoping that someone will recognize the man and get in contact with them. He may be the only person who knows what happened to Nancy Stewart Ranko Williams. Number 2. Annette K. Schnee and Barbara Jo Oberholzer In early 1982, 29-year-old Barbara Jo Oberholzer lived with her husband, Jeff, in the small town of Alma, Colorado. Jeff ran an appliance repair shop and Barbara worked in an office in the nearby town of Breckenridge. On January 6, 1982, Barbara had been promoted to office manager. After work, to celebrate her promotion, Barbara and some co-workers went to a bar that was located in the same strip mall as their office. Barbara called her husband Jeff and told him that she was going to stay for a few drinks. Jeff asked her if she wanted him to pick her up later, but she said no. She said she would just hitchhike home. At about 7.45 p.m., Barbara left the bar and she walked out into the cold January night. Her co-worker saw her standing in front of a nearby store hitchhiking. She was heading south towards Alma. At home, Jeff prepared dinner, but he fell asleep. Around midnight, he woke up and he was surprised that Barbara hadn't returned home. He figured that she was just having fun and chose to stay at the bar longer. But at around 2 a.m., after the bar was closed, she still hadn't returned home and he became worried. Jeff called her co-workers and they said she left the bar hours earlier. Jeff tried to report her missing, but the police told him it was too soon to file a missing persons report. The next day at about 3 p.m., 
The police were called by someone who had been cross-country skiing near Hoosers Pass. Hoosers Pass is a high mountain pass that connects Breckenridge and Elma. A woman's body had been found near the parking lot of the summit. The body was identified as 29-year-old Barbara Jo Ovalholzer. Based on the evidence found at the crime scene, the police were able to figure out what happened. It's believed that the killer picked up Barbara and started driving her home. He then pulled into the parking lot of the summit and tried to bound her with plastic zip ties. They think this is what happened because her keys were found in the parking lot and there was a plastic zip tie on one of her wrists. But it's believed that Barbara fought with her attacker. The police think she probably punched him in the nose and this caused him to bleed. She then got out of the vehicle and started running downhill. She made it about 300 feet and then she seemed to hesitate and she backtracked near a set of trees. She was then shot twice. One bullet grazed her right breast and the other one hit her in the chest. When she was shot, the shooter was about two or three feet away from her. Barbara either bled or froze to death. The gun wasn't recovered at the crime scene, but it was a 38 or 357 caliber handgun. The bullets were Peter's Copper jacketed hollow points. Near the body, the police found a backpack and a single orange sock. Neither of them belonged to Barbara. At first, it was a mystery as to who the items belonged to. But that mystery was solved about six months later when the body of 21-year-old Annette K. Schnee was found about 16 miles from Barbara's body. Annette was wearing the other orange sock. It was also determined that the backpack found near Barbara's body belonged to Annette. Annette went missing from Breckenridge just hours before Barbara was last seen hitchhiking out of town. At about 4.45 p.m. on the day she went missing, Annette picked up a prescription from a pharmacy in Breckenridge. She was seen talking to a woman outside of the pharmacy. The woman was described as slender and about 5 feet 5 inches tall. She looked a little rough like she had been camping for a few days. The woman smoked Marlboro cigarettes. Annette was supposed to work at a bar that was attached to a hotel in Breckenridge at 8 p.m., but she never made it to her shift. She didn't even make it home to pick up her work uniform. It's thought that after she picked up her prescription, she started hitchhiking towards home, and the killer picked her up. He took her to a secluded area near Sacramento Creek, where he sexually assaulted her. After the assault, Annette probably dressed quickly, and she put on one orange sock, and one sock that was striped. His thought she also ran away from her attacker. She had been shot once in the back with a handgun that was a 38 caliber, or a 357 caliber, or 9 millimeter. After shooting Annette, the killer drove back to Breckenridge, and he picked up Barbara. When Barbara was trying to escape, she probably knocked the orange sock out of the killer's vehicle. Even before Annette's body was found, the police thought that the two victims were connected simply because they went missing hours apart from the same small town. They also had similar physical features. They had long blonde hair, they were both 5'3", and they both weighed around 100 pounds. The first suspect in the case was Barbara's husband, Jeff Oberholzer. After both women went missing, Jeff was asked if he knew Annette Schnee. At first, he said no. But then he saw a news story about her disappearance, and he called the police. He said that he recognized her because a few months before she went missing, he picked her up while she was hitchhiking. On the drive, Annette mentioned she had an appliance that needed to be fixed. Jeff, who owned an appliance repair shop, 
gave her his business card. Jeff said he never saw or heard from Annette again. The police looked in Annette's wallet and they found Jeff's business card. Jeff also turned in two pieces of evidence to the police. He said on the same day that Barbara's body was found, he was driving on US 285 several miles from where she was killed and on the side of the road he happened to find Barbara's right glove that was bloodstained and a tissue that was also stained with blood. The police thought that this was too much of a coincidence and they had Jeff come in and do a polygraph exam. During the exam, he said he wasn't involved in either murder. He passed the polygraph exam, but he remained a suspect for years. Another suspect in the two murders is a man named Thomas Edward Luther. On February 13, 1982, just over a month after Barbara and Annette were killed, Luther picked up a 21-year-old woman at the bus depot in Breckenridge. The woman was supposed to get a ride to Silverthorne, Colorado with some friends, but her bus was late and she had missed her friends. Luther took the woman to an isolated area near Silverthorne. He sexually assaulted the woman and hit her in the head with a claw-tooth hammer. After he assaulted her, he let her go. She found help at a nearby house. She was taken to the hospital and she described her attacker's vehicle. The woman survived the assault and thanks to her description of the vehicle, Luther was arrested. In the summer of 1983, Luther pleaded guilty to sexual assault. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and then he was released in early 1993. On March 28, 1993, about three months after he was released from prison, Luther killed 20-year-old Cher Elder, who was the girlfriend of one of his friends. He shot her three times in the back of the head and buried her beside the interstate near Empire, Colorado. About two weeks after killing Elder, on April 12, 1993, Luther called 21-year-old Heather Smith, who lived in Denver. Smith had placed an ad in the newspaper trying to sell her car. Luther told her he wanted to come take a look at the car. Even though it was late in the evening, she agreed to show him the car. As she was showing him the car, he attacked her. When he did, Smith screamed and her neighbor heard it. Luther stabbed Smith five times before he got into his car and drove off. Smith was rushed to the hospital and she survived her attack. She gave a description of her attacker, but it didn't lead to an arrest. While Luther remained on the loose, he had become the prime suspect in the disappearance of Cher Elder. However, since the police couldn't find her body, they didn't have enough evidence to prove that Elder was dead, let alone that Luther killed her. Over a year later, in August 1994, Luther was in West Virginia. On August 21st, he picked up 32-year-old Bobby Joe Jones, who was hitchhiking near Delray. With Jones in the car, he stopped off at a remote cabin for a few minutes, and then they started driving again. He then found an isolated area and parked the car. He sexually assaulted and beat Jones, but ultimately, he let her go. Jones reported the assault and she gave the police the location of the cabin where they stopped. The police watched the cabin, and a few days after the assault, Luther returned to the cabin, and he was arrested. In January 1995, he was convicted of sexual assault, and he was sentenced to 17 years of prison. A month later, Cher Elder's boyfriend told the police where to find her body. When her body was found, the Denver Post ran an article on it. The article featured a photograph of Tom Luther. Heather Smith recognized him as the man who attacked her. Smith told the police that Luther was her attacker and he was charged with attempted murder. In the spring of 1996, 
Luther was found guilty of second-degree murder in the murder of Sher Elder. A month later, he was found guilty of attempted murder for the attack on Heather Smith. He received a sentence of 48 years for the second-degree murder conviction and 50 years for the attempted murder conviction. While Luther was in prison, he bragged about killing Barbara Oberholzer and Annette Schnee. Annette and Barbara were similar to Luther's other victims, who were all petite young women. The police interviewed Luther about the murders of Annette and Barbara, and he denied being involved. Luther took two polygraph exams, and he said he didn't kill the two women. He failed both times. A third suspect in the murders of Annette and Barbara is Tracy Petrocelli, who also went by the name John Maida. In the fall of 1981, Petrocelli and his 18-year-old girlfriend, Melanie Barker, broke up. Barker said she left Petrocelli because he was abusive and he was addicted to gambling. After the breakup, Barker moved from Reno, Nevada to Washington State. Petrocelli followed her there. And one day in April 1982, Petrocelli kidnapped her as she was leaving work. He held her captive for three days, and during that time, he beat her. On the third day of her captivity, she was finally able to escape, and Petrocelli was arrested. A month later, he was given a suspended sentence for kidnapping, and he was sent to a drug rehabilitation center. Petrocelli ended up leaving the program without completing it. Then one night in October 1981, Petrocelli showed up at the bar where Barker was working just outside of Seattle. He dragged her outside and shot her three times while the patrons of the bar watched on in horror. Petrocelli then went on the run. During his time on the run, it's suspected that Petrocelli traveled around the country and made friends with other criminals. He would team up with these men to commit robberies which often ended with them killing the robbery victim. Then after the robberies, Petrocelli would kill his accomplice. Around the time that Annette and Barbara were killed, Petrocelli was in Colorado. He and an accomplice, who has never been identified, went to a car lot at Thorne, Colorado, which is about 85 miles from Breckenridge. Petrocelli and his partner asked the salesman if they could take a car for a test drive. The salesman got into the car with Petrocelli and his accomplice. At some point during the test drive, Petrocelli's accomplice shot the salesman in the head. The salesman ultimately survived the shooting. Petrocelli then moved on to Nevada. On March 29, 1982, about three months after Barbara and Annette were killed, Petrocelli visited a car lot in Reno, Nevada. He got 63-year-old salesman John Wilson to go on a test drive with him. During the drive, Petrocelli shot and killed Wilson. About a month after Wilson's murder, the police received an anonymous tip that Petrocelli was renting a room in a house in Las Vegas, Nevada. He was arrested shortly after the police received the tip. In his possession was the gun he used to kill both Wilson and Barker. Petrocelli was found guilty of killing Wilson and he was sentenced to death. But in 2017, his death sentence was overturned and he is currently sitting in a Nevada prison. Petrocelli was asked about his time in Colorado and he said that he only spent one night in the state. He said he spent a night in Breckenridge. The hotel he stayed at was attached to the bar where Annette Schnee worked. The police have DNA samples from the man who killed Annette and Barbara, and the police compared the DNA to all three suspects. First, they compared the DNA of Barbara's husband, Jeff. It was not a match. Jeff was also able to supply alibi witnesses who saw him or spoke to him on the night of the murders. Based on the witnesses' accounts, 
Jeff wouldn't have had enough time to kidnap and kill both women. So he was officially eliminated as a suspect. Next, the killer's DNA was compared to the DNA of Thomas Edward Luther, who attacked a woman in Breckenridge a month after the two murders. He also supposedly bragged about killing Annette and Barbara while he was in prison. His DNA was not a match either. Finally, Tracy Petrocelli's DNA was compared to the killer's DNA. Just like the other two suspects, his DNA did not match. But at the time of the murders, Petrocelli was working with an accomplice who has never been identified. It's possible that Petrocelli and his accomplice killed Barbara and Annette together and the DNA belongs to his accomplice. But since the accomplice has never been identified, this is only speculation on the police's part. Luther and Petrocelli have not officially been eliminated as suspects. One final possible clue is a photograph that was found in Annette's backpack. Annette's backpack was found near Barbara's body. It is a photograph of a man who has never been identified. Annette's family and friends have never seen the man and they do not know why she had a photograph of him. The police think it's possible that Annette found the photograph in the killer's vehicle and she put it in her backpack as a way to identify him later. But this is just speculation on the police's part. The police hope someone will recognize the man because they would like to talk to him and see if he knows anything about the murders of the two women. Since the police have the killer's DNA, it could just be a matter of time before the culprit is caught through reverse genealogy. This is the process which helped catch the Golden State Killer, who is also known as the original Night Stalker. Investigators can input the killer's DNA in the public genealogy databases, and they should be able to find relatives of the killer. If they do find relatives, it will give them a small pool of possible suspects to investigate. So hopefully the next time we do a video on updates on cases previously featured on Criminally Listed, we'll be able to tell you that there was an arrest in the murders of Barbara Jo Oberholzer and Annette K. Schnee. Number 1. Alexander Mengel In September 1982, Gary Simulowski followed in the footsteps of his two older brothers and joined the Westchester County Police Department. Not long after he joined the force, he worked undercover on school campuses around the county trying to stem the flow of drugs. He was successful in his undercover job. In September 1984, he was named Police Officer of the Year for the county. However, due to budget cuts, Stimulowski was moved from undercover work to patrol work. On the evening of February 24, 1985, Stimulowski was patrolling the Sawmill River Parkway near Yonkers, New York. He noticed a Mercury Capri speeding and the driver changed lanes twice without signaling. After Stimulowski followed the car for a few minutes, he had the driver pull over. Simulowski radioed into his headquarters and gave them the license plate of the car that he pulled over. He walked up to the car and he found four people inside of it. Two men were in the front seats and a man and a woman were in the back seat. Simulowski had the driver step out of the car. The driver said his name was Alexander Mengel. He was a 30-year-old legal immigrant from Guyana. He came to the United States in November 1976, about eight years earlier. His family had moved from West Germany to Guyana sometime after World War II. It's not clear if Mango was born in West Germany or Guyana. For the past eight years, he had been living in the Bronx. He told Samowoski he had a New York driver's license. Mangel explained that he and his friends had spent the weekend hunting in the Catskills Mountains. He opened the trunk 
and he showed Semolowski the guns that were inside. Semolowski asked to see Mangle's driver's license, and Mangle said he would have to find it. Semolowski went back to his car, and he radioed in to his headquarters. He asked for backup because he wanted to search the car, but he was concerned because the occupants had guns. He asked the dispatcher to check the database to see if Alexander Mangle had a New York driver's license. The dispatcher told him that no one with that name had a New York driver's license. As Samowski sat in his police car, Mangle walked up to the car and shot him point blank in the head. Mangle's friends then drove away in his car. The car Mangle was driving didn't really belong to him. It was registered under Mangle's estranged wife's name. His estranged wife and their son had gone into hiding because Mangle had been horribly abusive for years. A year earlier, he had broke her jaw and he was arrested. After Mangle's friends took off in his car, Mangle got into Stimulowski's police car and drove it to a nearby neighborhood. He parked the car and then ran away. When Stimulowski's fellow officers found him, he was dying in the passenger seat of his patrol car. He was rushed to the hospital. The doctors worked on him for 90 minutes in the hospital, but it was too late, and 27-year-old Gary Stimulowski was pronounced dead. By the next morning, Alexander Mingo was the most wanted man in New York State. Within 48 hours of the shooting, the police had found Mangle's car and his friends who were in the car, but they weren't cooperating with the police. They only started talking after they were threatened with long prison sentences. They said that Stimulowski's murder was senseless and unprovoked. They thought Mangle killed him simply because he didn't have a driver's license and he thought the car would be towed. They swore they didn't know where he went after the shooting. Around the same time that Mangle's friends were talking to the police, the police got an anonymous tip from a young man in Buffalo, New York that Mangle was in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The police tracked down the caller and it was a young man who was a friend of Mangle's sister. The young man, who was a college student, said he was walking across his campus when he encountered Mangle. He told the police that Mangle looked considerably different than the last time he saw him. He was clean shaven, his hair was really short, and he was wearing red lipstick. He was driving a white Toyota car that looked new, but it was covered in mud. The police in Toronto and its surrounding cities were alerted to keep an eye out for Mangle, who may have been driving a white Toyota. On March 2nd, six days after Stimulowski was killed, a police officer in Scarborough, Ontario, which was a city that bordered Toronto, saw a white Toyota Tercel with New York license plates. He recognized the man behind the wheel from a photograph that he saw earlier. It was Alexander Mangle. When Mangle saw the police car, he sped off. After a short drive, Mangle abandoned his vehicle and ran. The officer chased after him. Mangle found himself cornered and he tried to pull a gun from the waistband of his pants. But he fumbled the gun and dropped it. He was arrested without anyone getting hurt or killed. The gun that Mangle dropped was Stimulowski's service weapon. The police checked the ownership of the white Toyota and it belonged to 44 year old Barbara Capone. Capone worked at an IBM satellite office in Ferry Dobbs, New York, not far from where Mangle ditched the patrol car. She had not been seen since leaving her office on February 25th about 24 hours after Stemolovsky was killed. The police searched Capone's car, and they were horrified by what they found. They found a woman's scalp with hair. The police suspected that it belonged to Capone. 
The police also found Capone's driver's license and the picture had been changed. In the photograph, Mangle is wearing Capone's hair as a wig. The police believe he wore the hair as a disguise when he crossed the border into Canada. The police asked Mangle what he did with Capone's body. Mangle admitted to stealing the car, but he said he never encountered the owner. In a wooded area in the Catskills, about 100 miles from where Capone went missing, the police found a summer cabin that had been broken into and ransacked. Inside the cabin, they found some of Capone's blood and her fingerprints. The police brought search dogs to the cabin, and they began to search the woods for Capone's remains. After a few hours of searching, they found her body, which was wrapped in a shower curtain that was taken from the cabin in the woods. The cause of death was two stab wounds to the chest. It was clear from the state of the remains that Mangle tried to make a mask to go along with his grotesque wig. A few weeks after he was arrested, on March 27th, the police in Canada handed Mangle over to detectives with the Westchester Police Department. A month later, on April 26, he was being transported to Catskills Village for an arraignment on the murder of Beverly Capone. At the arraignment, he pleaded not guilty. He was then put into the back of a police car with his hands cuffed in front of him. As he was being driven back to Westchester County, he attacked the officer who was in the seat next to him. First he headbutted the officer, and then he started biting him. During the attack, Mangle tried to pull the gun out of the officer's holster. The officer's partner, who was driving, pulled the car over. He then shot Mangle in the head. Mangle was pronounced dead at the scene. The officer who was attacked was taken to the hospital and he had to get stitches. The police don't think that Alexander Mangle's son murder spree was the only murders he committed. In fact, they think he was a serial killer. One potential victim was 13-year-old Antoinella Matina. Antoinella lived in Flushing, which is a neighborhood in Queens, New York. She went missing on July 16, 1984, after she walked out of a bank. This was less than a year before Mangle went on his murderous spree. Antoinella's body was found three years after she went missing in Westchester County. Her body was too badly decomposed to determine the cause of death. Mangle is considered a suspect in Antoinelle's murder for several reasons. Mangle's brother lived in the area where Antonella went missing. Mangle's estranged wife said she remembered that Mangle visited his brother on the day that Antoinella went missing. Also, Antoinella's body was found in an area that Mangle was known to go hunting. Finally, according to the book, Unearthing a Serial Killer by David Paul and Kevin F. McMurray, after Mangle was arrested, a man called the police in Yonkers. He told them they had called the police in Queens after Antoinella went missing, and he described a man that he saw her with as she was walking away from the bank. He said that after Mangle made the news, he saw a picture of him and recognized him as the man he saw with Antoinella shortly before she went missing. There were several odd things in Mangle's car that bolstered the police belief that he was a serial killer. The first was a tourist map of Pennsylvania. An area around Harrisburg was circled. In the circle were two X's. The X's were in forested areas and fields. Friends of Mangle said they spent time hunting in the Harrisburg area in 1982. Some people believe that the X's mark where Mangle either killed or buried his victims. The police also found five mysterious photographs in Mangle's car. One was a Polaroid and the other four were wallet sized prints. 
The photographs were of five teenage girls. They all look like they are class pictures that would have appeared in a yearbook. The police in Pennsylvania looked at their records and the photographs didn't match any missing persons reports or any Jane Doe's. To this day, the police don't know who the girls in the photographs are. They think it's possible that they could be other victims of Mangal. The police are hoping that people will recognize the girls and hopefully they'll be able to confirm that Mangal just had their photographs and he didn't kill any of them. But they aren't wholly optimistic about that. Unfortunately, we may never know how many people Alexander Mangal killed. Thanks a lot for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about exclusive podcasts. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.